Hey everybody, Josh from Silka here. Day 427 uh, of quarantine and uh, wanting to bring you a topic that we have been getting so many questions about, uh, I think largely because we just introduced a chain loop, but people are so fascinated uh, by chain, right? Like the details, the intricacies, how it works, why it's so hard to clean. Um, chain's a fascinating and complicated thing. So if you think back, to a bicycle, call it 100 years ago, and you think to a bicycle of today, essentially every single component has now been made of aluminum or titanium or carbon fiber. It's been updated, modified, tweaked, improved, made half the weight, a third the weight, a quarter the weight, in some cases a tenth the weight. And then there's the chain, which it's gotten smaller and narrower and um, you know it functions better, it's quieter, it can now shift and climb the shift ramps on the, the chain rings and the cassette. Uh, but it's really still just a bunch of, I've got one right here. It's hundreds and hundreds of pieces of stamped, uh, tumbled, fabricated, pressed together steel. Why is that? That seems kind of crazy. Like, why hasn't somebody made one of these in aluminum or titanium or plastic? Well, the answer is it's really hard. And the chain, uh, if you think of from 5-speed to 6-speed to 8 to 9 to 10, all the way up to the 12 and 13-speed uh, drivetrains we have today, um, the chain just keeps getting narrower and narrower. And that means the plates, the links here, um, the, the side plates, the inners, the outers, they all have to keep getting thinner and thinner. The tolerances are ever tighter. Um, the clearance is ever tighter. And they still have to be able to uh, to bend and deform to allow uh, for gear changing, right? So we talk about cross-chaining. Well, that's only possible because the chain isn't just straight, but actually can bend, right? And that's possible because there's little bits of clearance between uh, the inner and the outer link plates. What exactly does all this mean? I've got my model here, uh, my 3D CAD model going, so we can take a look at it. Um, and so let's look at this kind of at a macro scale. So what I've got right here in front of me um, is a little uh, cu couple links of uh, what would be like a modern Durace chain. And you can see I've got them color coded a little bit. So the darker uh, metal here is an inner plate. The uh, shiny chrome is an outer plate. The yellow metal here are the pins. And then if I spin it this way, you can see these uh, right here are called the rollers. Um, let's go ahead and take a cross section of this uh, so we can kind of look at just the true complexity inside the chain. So you look at each, each one of these little sections, right? You've got all these different parts and think about um, all the fitments here, right? The, from an engineering perspective, chain is the hardest thing to make in the bicycle because it is hundreds and hundreds of very highly tolerance parts that all have to fit together in really just a very specific certain way or the whole thing doesn't work and the cost of failure in the chain is really high so you've got two inner plates that are actually bent uh, they're actually stamped in a way that they form uh, a face that let's zoom in they form a face that touches and slides against or rotates directly against uh, the pin. So you think the pin is fixed to the outer plate, the inner plate rotates around that, and then you've got the roller in cross section here, um, which rotates around the, uh, the, the bent sections of the inner plate. And so as the chain is under tension, uh, and you think of how important the fitments are here, you see the, the inner plate faces are roughly touch fitting, uh, like almost a zero clearance fit to the pin. And you need that because otherwise when you put sudden tension on the chain, all those little gaps would be taken up and the chain would want to stretch, right? And that would be kind of unfortunate. Um, it would certainly feel funny to pedal that way because you would have the sort of slack being taken up uh, as the the chain comes over the, the cassette in the back, right? And you're, all of a sudden you're able to pull all these little bits of slack out of it. Um, 
actually as a chain wears, this is what we're measuring. So you're measuring chain wear is uh, essentially wearing of the metal faces in the gap right here. I'm trying to highlight with my mouse. Um, that as these surfaces are worn down, little gaps form and the chain grows longer. This also, I hope, shows why it's so hard to properly degrease the chain um, when it's on the bicycle using the brush and the uh, and the degrees are like we showed in our video. You know, there you think of. Uh, let's pop back out of it. So let me zoom in. So you see there's these little gaps. These gaps here are what allows the chain to have a little bit of flexibility uh, laterally. These are also the gaps that the lubricant have to go down into, um, also here at the rollers. And so you think of, in order to clean the chain properly, you can't just clean the gap here between these faces. Um, you really, as we cross-section, your degreaser has to get down inside, has to sort of turn the corner and then start cleaning out all of these interior and inner surfaces. That really just takes full immersion. That, that's why the immersion method is so much better, um, both for cleaning and for lubrication. I don't care how good a brush you have, uh, at best you might be able to get into these gaps. You are never going to turn that corner and scrub uh, these gaps out here, and especially I mean, the the clearance between these pieces is like less than a thousandth of an inch. Okay, uh, I mean a you know a, uh, what less than one fourth the thickness of a piece of uh, notebook paper. I mean very very tight uh, tight clearances in there. So this brings me to actually another the clearance versus tolerance topic. I see um, a lot on the internet, and we've had a lot of people ask questions about. People say that you know a certain chain maybe runs at higher friction because it has a lower uh, tolerance. Well, that's not necessarily true. It probably means that it's uh, it has a tighter fitment or less clearance. And so the way you think of that is, you know, the tolerance is the allowable um, size of something or gap or, or fitment of something. Uh, it's the allowed variance. And so. Like in this model here, this gap uh, between the inner and outer plates is around uh, 0.2 millimeters. The tolerance would be, say, say it's 0.2, and say the tolerance is plus or minus 0.05. Um, that the plus or minus 05 is the tolerance of that. The clearance, though, or the the fitment, is actually that number itself. You know, if I wanted to fit this at say 0.15 instead of 0.2. Well, that's just a tighter clearance, right, or a tighter fitment. Uh, the tolerance may actually be the same. Where tolerance has become critical, especially with chain, is you think of what's called tolerance stacking. So the thickness of the outer plate here has a tolerance. The thickness of the inner plate has a tolerance. The thickness of the roller has a tolerance. The thickness of the other plate has one. The other outer plate has one. And then the pin itself has a tolerance. And so. All of those stack up, they're all additive, uh, and that's where the engineers struggle. I mean, that, and that's where really young, inexperienced engineers can get themselves in trouble. Um, it, it seems simple, and it is, I guess, in your mind, but in practice, it's really, really hard. Um, you know, 20 years ago, we, I, I was developing and manufacturing the carbon crank sets for Campagnolo and uh, their facility in Vicenza, Italy, a beautiful facility. We spent a lot of time there and their chain machine actually used um, optical separators to separate all of the parts uh, into their tolerance bands beforehand and then they would match them. And so maybe you had a slightly thicker plate here so you would use a slightly thinner plate there. Um, really a beautiful way of handling uh, you know, the, the tolerancing versus fitment challenge um, that, uh, that, that engineers and companies have. One of the big tolerance challenges is that the, the costs associated with tolerancing are highly nonlinear, right? So if I want to make something um, at half the tolerance, or I guess might call it twice the tolerance, twice as tight in tolerance, you're looking at a minimum four times the cost. Uh, to get there, so it's a it's a very uh, nonlinear curve. You know, we see this with bearings. Um, you know, a twenty millionth 
um, uh, round ball bearing, you buy those by the kilogram, right? They don't even count them. Uh, you get to a 10 millionth of an inch tolerance bearing, um, and it might be, you know, 10 to 20 cents, depending on where it was manufactured and what the material is. Uh, you get to a 5 millionth bearing, it's probably a dollar a bearing. And you get to like a 1 millionth bearing, which is typically a ceramic material, those can be anywhere from 10 to $15 per bearing. Um, you know, and, and when you think of it, we went from 20 to 10 to five to maybe three or to, to one um, in, in that 20 times uh, tolerance tightening, we went from something that was so inexpensive to produce that you're not even paying for the item, you're just buying a mass of it um, to paying you know $20 a ball uh, in some instances. So just think about that when you think of these things, the tolerance versus fitment. Modern high uh, gear count drivetrains, right? 10 speed, 11 speed, 12 speed, 13 speed. As the chain gets narrower, the tolerances have to become smaller um, because you really st you need these gaps, these fitments, to stay about the same uh, because the chain has to move a similar amount in the back. So we can't just tighten up the negative space and keep the other parts of the chain the same thickness. Uh, we actually have to make all the chain parts thinner so that the negative spaces or the gaps um, can stay about the same. That's a really hard engineering problem. Now, this is just uh, the chain itself. So think about, uh, you know, as you're making chain, right, how the assembly goes. It's two inner plates sandwiching uh, the two, here, let me kind of spin around, uh, sandwiching the two rollers here. Um, those pieces then go in, uh, the pin is dropped in, um, the two outer plates, and then that has to be riveted together very precisely to lock them, the outer plates, onto the pin, but not swelling the pin enough that it causes additional friction um, or tightness with the inner plates. Um, this is why chains are, the, the good ones are, are rather expensive, but honestly, it, as an engineer, as somebody who's dealt with this for a long time, I am shocked at how inexpensively we can make a chain um, with the tolerances and everything that, that we've got. I think that really speaks to uh, automation and technology and the machine builders and designers who, uh, who work in the background on this. You know, this, I pulled this out the other day, it was a little fragment of nine speed uh, chain that I had laying in an old toolkit. You know this this chain. You you can probably find today. It's a what is a SRAM uh, PC 991. You can probably get this chain online for something like twelve dollars. And you think about it, it's it's somewhere on the order of like six hundred individual highly toleranced, highly manufactured components, all assembled basically perfectly uh, to run as nicely as it does. And you. You're paying, uh, you know, fractions of a penny per per component, and, and that's assembled and transported to wherever you are. It's quite impressive. Uh, so chain, I guess my, my big rule there is respect it. Now, the second piece of this, and this is where we start getting into uh, talking about friction and and functionality and the free running of the chain. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on in the modern chain, and let's look at this here. You know, this, like I said, this is a model um, of a of a Dura Ace chain, and you can actually see these aren't just flat pieces of uh, of steel. You know, they're chamfered on the of these outer edges. You know, we're chamfered on the inner edges here. Um, a lot of that is for shifting performance. You have a similar thing going on the inner links. Uh, the inner links themselves are high precision formed. Um, so that they match up with the rollers and then the uh, and the pin the pins are machined really about as perfectly as you can machine them um, So that they have minimal friction because remember the outside of the pin is a running surface for that inner uh, link plate um, But then these are also drilled hollow for weight savings. I mean, so it's just a lot of manufacturing processes to make a relatively small part Let's look at all the places where friction can occur in the chain, and this will really help us get our, our heads around uh, all the ways that we can improve things uh, to make the chain faster, run quieter, um, help with lubrication, etc. So I'm zoomed in here um, on 
uh, kind of one of the nodes, right? So we've got the pin. Uh, let's look at it from the side here. So I've got my pin, um, my outer plate, my inner plate, my roller. Let's zoom in and then we'll give ourselves. So we see that when the chain is straight, these gaps are straight, right, through all of them. And your friction there is really just going to be on the inner plate surfaces rubbing against the pin. So as the, uh, you know, as the chain is wrapping around the cog or the pulley, you're getting these, these deflections, right? And this is, this is purely just the inner plate, uh, there are the two inner plates running uh, around the pin. And so it would make sense that this, the smoothest inner pin, the smoothest uh, inner plate surface are going to be good here. And then you want to get a good lubricant in there. Um, but what really starts to get interesting uh, is the gap here uh, between these plates. And this is because you just have more leverage, uh, more surface area of contact, but you also have a longer effective lever arm um, when you think of how the, the chain begins to bend, right, when you're cross-chaining, um, and I don't have it in my model here where I can cross-chain it, but let's look. It, as you begin to cross-chain, this surface here is going to begin to touch here. That's almost twice the lever arm, so to speak, um, that the friction has on the system. Um, and then think of the surface area here. You know, you're not just running... Uh, around the pin, but you actually have sort of a face-on-face, -face, um, uh, you know, sort of a rubbing going on. And this is why it's really critical to get a lubricant in there that's going to keep those two metal surfaces from touching each other. If you remember when we did the chain cleaning video and I popped the master links off, it wasn't this one, but uh, I popped the master link off and I took a photo of it for you and you could see the kind of beautiful circular, um, almost brushed look that was created on the inside of the, uh, of the master link. Well, that, it's a good look, um, but that is actually the result of metal on metal rubbing, uh, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of times where the two metal surfaces are just essentially scraping against each other to create that, uh, that kind of circular, uh, swirled surface finish, you know, that's not good uh, from a friction perspective. And so, you know, this is where uh, one of the reasons that the track bikes are so efficient, right? You get that perfect chain line and we can really get the, the friction in the chain just down to those roller to interplate interferences. Uh, whereas in a road drive train, you're almost never perfectly aligned. There's almost always some element of angularity um, and that's always going to drive a little bit higher frictions. You know, Jason Smith at Friction Facts uh, and his data, I mean, he showed you, you could essentially more than double um, the friction of the chain uh, as you worked your way up the cluster and cross-chaining, you could, I mean, it was like triple almost the, um, uh, the amount of friction in the system uh, by going to like an extreme uh, cross-chain. So just something to think about uh, that, you know, maybe that going that one more cog in the back might actually be costing you more watts than are probably worth saving if you had just bumped down and, uh, you know, kept a straighter chain line. It's also the one, one of the reasons I, I'm not a huge, huge fan of the one by um, systems because you're, you know, you're requiring a lot of extreme uh, chain positions that maybe you could have handled otherwise if you had a two by system. But, uh, so let's look at this. This is, uh, I'm going to cut into, sorry, I'm going to cut into my chain here. Let's cut it in half. Okay, so let's get down, let's look at these surfaces. So these, the, all the components of the chain are essentially steel plate. And steel plate uh, is made by rolling. First they hot roll it, then they cold roll it between rollers uh, to get a, to just the right thickness and they'll use an ever finer polish on the roller, but you still end up with a slightly imperfect surface because nothing uh, has a perfect surface. And so I've got some pictures here um, that, that we found. This is an amazing kind of metrology technology uh, uh, called optical surface prophylometry. 
and it's giving us a visual of the um, surface at a very tiny level. So each of these uh, images here is a is about a one by one millimeter square, and then you're actually seeing the uh, what we call the RZ value. It's the the difference in height uh, of the metal. And so here, this one is interesting. You can see different. Uh, diff the different rolling processes of a metal. So the first roll, the second roll, the third, all the way out. You see it gets finer and finer, but it never really gets perfectly smooth. Um, and so the touching components of the chain, uh, inner and outer plates, they are all rolled surfaces that are then chrome plated or maybe like nickel Teflon plated. But let's look super close at what those surfaces look like. You see here that they're beautiful surfaces, uh, it maybe you know a foot away or even up close. But when you really get down at it, uh, they still have a vertical roughness of somewhere on the order of like nine micro inches, uh, which works out to be about a half a micron. So these surfaces, as shiny and pretty as they look to the eye, and even as shiny and pretty as they look under some general uh, kind of microscopy, they just aren't all that smooth. And this is one of, I think, the coolest things about uh, engineering for me is how, you know, nothing is really perfect, right? There's no such thing as round. There's no such thing as flat. There's no such thing as smooth. Um, these are all relative things, right? So no matter how smooth and perfect you make a surface, somebody can come along with a better measuring technology and show you that it's actually not that smooth at all. Um, same thing with round. Uh, polished, I mean, you, you name it, uh, you know, there's always some variance in tolerance. And so it's really kind of chasing an impossibility, uh, you know, sort of an asymptotic uh, relationship that we're after here. We, we want to make it as smooth as we possibly can. Um, but of course, knowing that there's incredible nonlinearity uh, in these tolerances and smoothnesses uh, and finishes. So let's look at uh, the chain plates here. What, what we end up with is uh, this is about a 0.6 micron RZ um, on, the, on the plates of the chain here. That, that's actually it's quite impressive, um, but it's not perfect. And you know, one of the things that you're, you're after is to uh, you know, how do we take this, you've got a 0.6 variance, so think of it almost like a, um, at a very tiny scale, it's almost like a sandpaper, right? And so you have, you know, think of two sandpapers rubbing against each other, uh, there's going to be friction, right? And of course, the smoother we can make that, uh, the better, but of course, we can't make the metal any smoother than it is uh, when, when it comes to us. So what we want to do is we want to you know, fill that in with something to uh, to reduce the friction. This is one of the reasons the wax is so powerful. The wax can really kind of get in there. Uh, you know, I mean, you look at the profile again. The wax can really fill in all those little crevices, um, and then form as a nice kind of a semi-rigid barrier uh, between the two surfaces. But this is really, to me, where I think the beauty of the tungsten disulfide strategy comes in. We knew going into our chain loop project, and I think this has been known for molybdenum disulfide and a bunch of others, PTFE, for a long time, that you know you can use these low friction particles to fill some of these voids, some of these gaps. And the beauty of the tungsten is that its molecular structure allows us to produce it at these nanometer scales. So, you know, in a I think of this point, uh, call it a point six micron finit or uh, 0.6 micron RZ. It's the peak to valley of 0.6 microns. Well, we can make the tungsten disulfide at 0.6 microns. It's about 600 nanometers. Um, and we can put those platelet flakes into the lubricant, into the wax, and they will actually sort of like almost snowflake down and then be kind of rubbed in by the adjacent uh, metal and actually impinge and kind of permanently uh, leave, you know, leave themselves stuck in these crevices. And what that does in the system here is it leaves you with two metal surfaces, both imperfect, but are now both filled with these very low uh, coefficient of friction particles that sit 
mostly buried in the metal, but sit a little bit proud. And now a lot of that that direct rubbing, surface-on-surface uh, -surface rubbing, is actually the tungsten disulfides rubbing against each other. This is one of the, the ways that these particles uh, you can reduce wear and reduce friction. You know, I'm sure you've seen forever, you know, moly grease, uh, molybdenum disulfide. Um, that's been used in automotive greases and bearings forever and ever, and it's amazing stuff, but it's a much bigger particle than this. And so, you know, you think of a, a typical automotive bearing is not finished anywhere near as smooth and fine um, as this chain is. And so, you know, if you've got a, you know, call it a, uh, six to ten micron finish, uh, then that, you know, six, eight, ten micron diameter molybdenum disulfide uh, uh, particle is going to fit in there nicely and work well. But of course, in this system, uh, the chain where you're 0. 0.6 microns, a molybdenum disulfide uh, of six to ten microns, it's, it's almost like a you know, I think of it as like a, a you know, a, a basketball on your driveway, right? The, the driveway is actually pretty rough and has all these little peaks and valleys, but of course when you bounce the ball on it, it doesn't stick down in there because it's just so much bigger uh, than the scale of the roughness. And that's really the key uh, to the, the friction strategy here, is that we want to identify the surface as we've got it, and then we want to identify and refine the particle um, to really work its way in there and actually modify the surface. And so that's one of the beauties of the, the matching the tungsten disulfide molecule to the surface at hand is that you end up permanently uh, improving the surface uh, and permanently changing the coefficient of friction of the surface uh, through the addition of these particulates. So uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff covered there. Uh, I think I hope it was interesting and maybe even a little bit entertaining to you to learn some of these things. We will talk even more uh, about chain in the future because I we just you guys have so many awesome questions about it and I think uh, yeah it's one of those things that for as long as it's been around and as simple as it seems it is super super complex. So please uh, like us below, subscribe to us, share us with your friends, uh, and in your comments, uh, please keep leaving awesome comments and, uh, and your awesome questions because we'd love to come and answer them. And uh, yeah, thanks for watching.